Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Pokies Burke, and this is the Career Slay Podcast. Imagine the impact we could have on society if everyone loved what they did. That's what Career Slay is all about. I'm interviewing people who love their jobs and asking them how they got there and what they've learned along the way. We're here to slay the fear in career. My next guest on Career Slay is Jorge Almeida. Jorge has over 12 years of experience in marketing and multicultural advertising, both on the agency and client side, having worked at Lerma, Anheuser-Busch, InBev, and most recently Avocados from Mexico. At ABI, he led all creative and content development for Budweiser, as well as worked on campaigns for Bud Light, Michelob Ultra, Chelada, and launched two Mexican imports into the Texas market, Montejo and Estrella Jalisco. At Avocados from Mexico, he helped them get named the most innovative branding company by Fast Company and worked on buzzworthy Super Bowl campaigns. Jorge is originally from the border town of El Paso, Texas, but lived in multiple South American countries before making his way back to the U.S. to attend St. Edwards University in Austin for his undergraduate studies in marketing. He recently graduated with his MBA from Cox School of Business at Southern Methodist University in 2021, where he was awarded the Dean's Legacy Award. Jorge is an avid marathon runner and most recently became a dad to his firstborn daughter, Jimena. He was actually my former coworker, and I'm so excited to have you on the show today, Jorge. Thank you for having me. I still have a big heart for avocados from Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so Jorge, let's just dive in. Tell us about your story. What was your childhood like? My childhood. So if there's one word to sum it up, I would say it's change. Uh, When I was in the third grade, my dad came home from work one day with this gift for me and my older sisters. And it was a shirt that looked like the Texas flag, but it wasn't the Texas flag. It was actually the flag of Chile, the country. So that was his way of telling us, hey, we're all moving to Chile. We lived there for a year. And then from there we lived, and this is because my dad used to work for Coca-Cola, so they just kind of hopped us around a little Mm -hmm. tour of South America. We lived in Colombia for two years, Argentina for a year, Buenos Aires was beautiful, loved it. And then a couple years in Monterey, Mexico, before I kind of did a whole turn back to where I'm originally from, which is El Paso, Texas. So. Wow. So it was a kind of a crazy upbringing, but it kind of made me who I am. You know, I'm very outgoing. I could be in a room with strangers and talk to anyone just because I kind of had to do that so many times in my upbringing. Wow. Yeah, that's so amazing. And what a great experience to have as a child. Yeah. No wonder you have so much woo. <laughs> From Strengths Quest, yes. Yeah. <laughs> woo is winning others over. <laughs> So you get back to El Paso. Yeah. What happens next? In El Paso, the school that I went to, there was a lot of competition. It was a smaller school, but a lot of competition on, you know, what colleges, what universities. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, there was a lot of interest uh, of buying to to leave El Paso because, again, I'm just so used to change. Uh, and I set my eyes on Austin, not UT, uh, but a small school, mm-hmm. uh, St. Edwards University, Go Hilltoppers. Uh, I was in marketing and then probably around my junior year, I started looking at internships Mm -hmm. and I was really into Mad Men. I, you know, aspired to be the good parts of Don Draper, not, (laughs) not the bad parts. And then, yeah, junior year, I got my first internship at Latin works, which is a Hispanic agency in Austin that's rebranded and renamed, but that's when I got my first taste of advertising. And it was so great to do an internship so early on, because in general, we can all agree internships really give you a good perspective of what the day to day of that job is. So as a junior, I was really seeing already, okay, do I want to do this post graduation? You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you kind of took the marketing advertising route, interned at Latin Works. Is that where you worked after college? No, that's when a small agency here in Dallas, Texas, uh, had just won the Home Depot account at the time called Richards Lerma, now called Lerma Agency. And yeah, they reached out to me and said, hey, would you like to join us? Uh, there is an agency of, I believe, five at the time. Uh, I was, you know, employee number six or seven, if I remember correctly. And it was a tumultuous time because this is 2009-ish. So we were just coming out of a recession and such. And I think it was, you know, very proud moment of mine to be able to do the internships I did in undergrad, make the connections and, um, you know, have a job already secured on graduation. Yeah. So what did you do at Lerma? I rolled up to Lerma uh, and I had, you know, this 
open eyes of, okay, let's do advertising. Let's be Don Draper. Let's make ads. And it was definitely mm-hmm. not what you would see in Mad Men in the golden age of advertising. But there was a a huge just appetite for, for creativity. And I just fell in love with that. I fell in love with creative brainstorms uh, internally of, you know, discussions on new business pitches. So I really fell in love with the, the art of selling ideas. And that's when I quickly learned that's what advertising really is. And I think that's, that's where I really liked the whole aspect of agencies and working as a team, right? Everyone together for one client, one account, trying to better the business. Yeah. Oh, I mean, my background's in advertising of too. Course. So I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about and just the, that love for creative ideas, storytelling, selling. So were you on the account side, strategy, media? So I was brand management or account management. I was on the account side. And I think it was very interesting because much like it happens in in agencies, which you're very familiar, you kind of start with some of those projects that no one really wants to start on. Certainly. And and in my uh, experience, it was actually very beneficial because one of the first projects I got to do was regarding YouTube, which at the time wasn't what it is now. What is YouTube? But it was so great to earn my stripes, to start with smaller projects, get more responsibility, get good mentors and eventually make it to do, you know, bigger projects like uh, TV productions. Yeah. Let's talk about mentorship for a second. How has mentorship played a role in your career? It probably started you know, early on and especially pivotal was my undergraduate at St. Edwards that I mentioned. I started just reaching out anyone who would talk to me. All right. Mm-hmm. And I think it was always related to advertising just mm-hmm. because I wanted to make sure that's where I wanted to start my career. And I, I kid you not, Kelly, everyone was always willing to to talk to me. Right. And it was never one of these things where it seemed like I was looking for a job. I wouldn't even mention it, but that's where I picked people's brains. And I think that was great because a lot of good mentors would put things in perspective. So I think mentorship is huge to make sure you're going in the right path and that, you know, you're getting informed before you make big decisions. For sure. All right. So let's go back a sec. What did you do after Lerma? So while I was in my last years at Lerma, this is about four or five years into it, I, I started getting a little bit, I wouldn't say desperate, but but more impatient. Uh, Mm -hmm. My my mind always thinks, okay, what's next, you know? And then again, through my connections that I had at one of my internships in undergrad, you know, one day I got a call and said, hey, there's this uh, brewing company in St. Louis who's looking for a, you know, regional marketing uh, person to Mm -hmm. work out of Dallas. And I already recommended you. And I said, oh, okay, great. You know, let's go. So from Lerma, I moved on to Anheuser-Busch. You know, just a little brewing Just a little brewery, just a couple of (laughs) beers here and there. They don't have problems with brand awareness, that's for sure. Nailed the interviews, got the job. And then, you know, there I was uh, working for the biggest brewery in the U.S. And, you know, Anheuser-Busch has a lot of marketing resources and a lot of smart, great people. And and it was also a very interesting dynamic because I was in a Dallas office, which is not the main headquarters, Mm -hmm. meaning there was marketing folks here, but it was more of a sales office. So I got to really learn that sales office, learn what their needs were. And, you know, I was always just the marketing guy, but the marketing guy who could help. Very tactical, you know, not, not the traditional brand building, but it was great experience and awesome that I got to do that after a couple of years in, in on the agency side. So, you know, there's a delineation between working on the agency side and working on the client side. Can you talk a little bit more yeah. about making that hop and what were the differences? Of course. I would say the pivotal moment I realized I wanted to go client side was where I realized that, that it, and it kind of hit me this aha that on the corporate marketing side, there's still a lot of internal selling that you have to do, right? So I realized that that the selling that we did on the agency went to certain people. And then those certain people, our day-to-day clients, would then just sell up, right? And yeah. I realized, okay, well, how, how would it be like to be the one who's on the client side doing the internal selling, storytelling and pitching? I was like, okay, there could be great opportunities for me to now just work with a great agency, get a great idea, and then be the one who pushes for it internally. There's still a lot of creativity on the corporate marketing side. A lot of people think it's just more boring. (laughs) Yeah, there's a little bit of that, but there's still some fun and creativity, even if you're not on the agency side. Yeah, I think what I found, because I I made the hop from agency Mm -hmm. to client side too, is that, you know, the marketing communications piece is still part of your role. It's just now you have all of these other facets of business Mm -hmm. that you have to care about as well, like the supply chain, ops, Mm -hmm. innovation, pricing, like all of that stuff Mm -hmm. is kind of encapsulated into one. So um, I think I remember my first time I worked at PepsiCo, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing advertising plus all of this other stuff. It was a 
an awakening for sure. And and it's so funny you say that. I don't know if this happened to you, Kelly, but when I was on the agency side, there was many times where I would get frustrated and say, why isn't the client getting back to me? You know, like, (laughs) because to put it in perspective and anyone who's in advertising can, can, can realize this, the things that are on top of your mind when you're on the agency side are the most important things. And it's usually needing the client to respond. But when you're on the flip side, when you're on the client side, you do realize not minimizing by any means, but you realize that the agency stuff that's high priority is, is maybe middle of your list. Cause you've got this other important things that you've got to deal, yeah. you know, a big presentation, a re- internal recap or a performance meeting uh, or a finance end of year meeting, things like that, that are happening that I think it's definitely unfortunate that on the agency side, you don't see all these things. Yeah. Right. But, but yeah, the, the priorities ha- do shift when you go agency to client. And sometimes when you're the client, you've got so much going on that it's really hard to get to the agency. And I used to tell my agency this, I'm sorry, it's not because I don't think this is important, but some of your agency uh, requests or emails are the ones I get to like at five in the afternoon, right? <laughs> After all the days of meetings, I'm, I know you've been there, right? And that just For happens. Sure. And it's just the nature of the beast, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, going back to that point about internal selling, Mm -hmm. it's all about getting alignment at senior leadership levels. And the better you are at selling as a client, Mm -hmm. the happier your agencies will be because they need a champion to like champion the idea and push it forward. Right. Yep. Because everyone's going to be scared if it's a really creative idea. But if you have someone who's willing to stand up and say, no, this is what we got to do as like a brand, as a company, it makes it easier for senior leadership to trust in the person that's selling the idea. Definitely. And and I think it takes both sides, the agency and the client to really believe in something and to sell together passionately. Yeah. I also think that I can't do my job as a client without the trust and partnership of the agency there's always this like tension because there's competing priorities mm-hmm. when you get to great work it's it's a function of true partnership mm-hmm. right so after anheuser busch what did you do next you know a couple of years and now you know me and i'm you know starting to try like what's next uh, in a blink of an eye i was already part of the avocados from mexico team so every time you wanted a transition, were you the one to reach out or were people reaching out to you or is it all about just staying connected? All about connection because in the Lerma, Anheuser-Busch and Avocados examples, it was always people in my network and, and it did vary. It wasn't always them reaching out or me reaching out. It was a combination sometimes, but I will say that I've probably submitted more than a hundred applications to different, you know, employers Mm -hmm. all over the U S we've all been there. And it was just so interesting that the instances where I was proactive about it and submitting resumes and trying to get out there, not even a, you know, thank you. Right. And I think that's, that's disappointing. And I do hopefully say this so that anyone listening could realize that we've all been there, right? It doesn't matter how successful people are, but I I would encourage people to not get disappointed if they're not getting anywhere, but to leverage the power of networking and connections. So you came from El Paso, small Mm -hmm. town. I imagine that, you know, you had to build your network from scratch. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell that person who is thinking to themselves, I don't have a network. I don't know how to do this. I would tell them you'd be surprised how much you can get out of it without trying not to get something out of it, right? Mm -hmm. There's this great book from Adam Grant called Givers and Takers. And it talks about the perception that a lot of people think that the people who are most successful are those who just kind of take, 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 take. But in the long run, it's actually those who just give who actually end up becoming more successful. But I bring that up because it puts it in perspective that there's this mindset that, oh, you know, I don't want to reach out to this person because they just think I'm looking for a job. Sometimes you just have to put yourself out there and try it and just be surprised. Because again, uh, like I said, when I was an undergrad, there were many times where I was just meeting people for coffee to learn and, mm-hmm. and a job opportunity would come from it. Right. But it was not because, you know, I sat down on that coffee and said, hey, I need a job. It was just, hey, let me let me learn. If you come from an angle of wanting to learn, asking questions, people will always take you up on it, will always be very, very helpful. And and I hope in in my now more 12 years of of career that I'm starting to do that with with, you know, younger students. Now I'm realizing, okay, now it's my turn to pay it back. That's great. All right. Let's talk about avocados from Mexico. Avocados from Mexico. Avocados from Mexico. Yes. What did you do there? 
I was in two roles. I started as a digital marketer and we were able to execute some great Super Bowl campaigns, Cinco de Mayo campaigns, and just overall push forward a lot of good digital and social content that that not only got a lot of engagement, but just made people smile. But with the challenge is that it's trying to be a brand within produce, which is a brand not, left category. Yeah, and you know all about this. You're the brand queen for avocados now. But but yeah, there was a lot of challenges, even on digital social or even with celebrities or with health and wellness campaigns. Just really trying to connect with people. We weren't the ones who probably invented the avocado toast trend, but we like to say that we definitely fueled it, you know, and <laughs> and and had a role in in getting avocado toast all across America. Yeah. Towards the end of my career at Avocados, I was working to support the food service team, mm -hmm. more from like a sales side, and I think that's where mm -hmm. back to my enhancer Bush experience, I learned a lot of dealing with you know key accounts and 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 such, and trying to talk their language and get them to understand from a business standpoint how we can work together. So that was really great on the food service side. Plus, got to taste some really good food from the in-house chef. Shout out to Stephen Bell. And we actually went to Michoacan, Mexico, yes. where the avocado groves of are. We actually invite top accounts to go down to the avocado groves, to what we call avocado land, and to actually get to touch the avocado trees and, you know, talk to them about the volcanic soil and the richness and, you know, the bloom cycles and things like that. So, yeah, I got to go on those trips a couple of times and it was always great to, you know, see not only the food service accounts, but any internal members or other people that we'd bring on just light up when they would see the hills and hills of it's avocados. Beautiful. It is beautiful. So while you were at Avocados from Mexico, you got your MBA, right? I did here at down the street at Southern Methodist University, Dallas, Texas, Pony Up. And uh, I think it was one of those things where I just felt like, again, I needed to challenge myself and, you know, for personal improvement. But I was just blown away from the whole experience, right? Once once you get there and you have this expectation of people in suits and being, you know, very serious. And there is some of that, just like we were talking about corporate marketing. But but no, I was just blown away by the people, the diversity of opinions and thoughts and, and practices. And it's a great networking tool, but you just meet a lot of great people that end up becoming close friends. It was a master's in marketing concentration. First year, you take a lot of kind of basics and then you go into more marketing specifics. But especially that second year, just having marketing conversations about brand repositionings or Super Bowl launches and actually seeing some of my work through Budweiser avocados being used as references and stuff that was always That's rewarding cool. and having those conversations. And that was probably the best part is having those classroom discussions about where marketing is going, you know, how can people do things better? And yeah, it was a great experience of me of, of two years in a, in a master's program. So you actually now go back and talk to Correct. SMU students. So the f one of the first months uh, in person during uh, my MBA experience is the Business Leadership Center put together a talk and uh, they do these monthlies, their luncheon speaker series. And I remember my first one, you know, me trying to think ahead and, and be the person that I am. I sat on my first one. I said, you know what? One day I'm going to do one of these. I was already getting my you know diploma and I was already asking the Business Leadership Center, hey, can I go speak? Can I can I be a speaker? I already know what I want to talk about. They're like, Jorge, you're being impatient again. We have to wait until, you know, more than six months after you've graduated. And there I was, you know, nervous about what were they going to think about my presentation? It was on change. I talked a lot about my upbringing and all the change I had to go through. And, and I brought the lens of marketing, right? How as mm -hmm. marketers do we have to be adaptable to change? Mm -hmm. If anything, we should be the leaders of change because we're all about, you know, trends and, you know, the cultural times and marketers should be the most agile for change. And that's my whole topic in a nutshell. And I got a teaching excellence award, which, you you know, I've, I've printed out in front of my fridge now to show. All right. So tell me a little bit more about what you do outside of work. Yes. Let's talk outside of work. We haven't even talked about my biggest passion, which is running. I'm a huge runner and a lot of people eye roll. But yeah, I've been running probably since I was in high school. Did my first half marathon, San Francisco half marathon, running on the Golden Gate Bridge. Wow. And for those of you who don't know, half marathon's about 13 miles, 13.1, <laughs> just to be clear. So Thank you. challenging for a <laughs> for a high schooler. But yeah, and then I just got stuck. I just fell in love with with the whole aspect of challenging my body. How did you get into it? I'll have to say it goes back to my dad. My dad's been a marathon runner. My first two marathons, the Austin Marathon, I ran with my dad. So that was very nice oh, father-son moment to, to run together. And I've just been stuck because it's a, honestly a, a, tied to a journey of self-improvement, you know, mm -hmm. because after every race, I was like, okay, I did it. It was hard. But what's next? Can I do it faster? How many have you done? I've done 23 marathons. Oh, my gosh. Yep. You're about to hit a marathon of marathons. <laughs> almost. I did. Yeah, you're right. Right? Yep. Almost at 26 marathons. Yep. Oh, my gosh. That's so cool. And you actually 
turn your passion into a little side hustle, I right? I do have a side gig, a little shout out, go running tours Dallas. If anyone wants to get a tour of Dallas while running, hit me up. I'm on Instagram and I can give you guys a tour of Dallas. It's a great thing to actually turn two of my passions into a little side gig, which is running and talking. So works perfect. <laughs> works perfect. I'll be on a segue. I think that <laughs> will be that. The, the easiest way yes. to keep up with you. Yes, yes. I love that how running is your passion because, you know, a lot of us think that we got to put all of this time and effort into like our work. And Mm -hmm. sometimes it deprioritizes the other facets of our life that Mm -hmm. actually make us whole, particularly exercise. Like Mm -hmm. it is a struggle. You know, you have the kids, you are trying to get out the door, you know, just putting in that time for yourself. And so really kudos to you for making the time and really activating on your passion. Thank you. And I think the biggest misconception is, oh, do you have to be this super, you know, hard crafting? And I would say to your point on balancing, I will always tell people you don't have to run every day to be a marathon runner. Right. And Mm -hmm. actually uh, two things. One, rest is important, getting good sleep. And and especially when things are starting to get tight and you start feeling some injuries, but then cross training and mixing it up. The most important thing is to, of course, have your core miles that you got to hit week to week, but then, you know, resting as well, because that's if you don't rest, injuries happen or you just get mentally fatigued, you know. And there's a lot of mental endurance yep. that, you know, is tied to the physicality of running a marathon. Completely. Those last miles, it's all just mental. You usually train to at least run 20 miles in your training plan. So the real big challenge is miles 20 to 26. That's when you want to stop. That's when you want to start walking. That's when injuries start really be- becoming even more annoying. So those last six miles definitely feel harder and you need that mental fortitude more so than the first 20. Yeah, I I tell myself, you know, if if you're going through a hard time, just put one foot in front of the other, right? And I think it's the same sort of, I've never run a marathon, but (laughs) I think it's the same sort of mindset that you need to have. Completely. I think I've learned to just not stop because Mm -hmm. mentally it just kind of feels like a defeat. And I, of course, take that application and put that into other things like work, you know, and when things are getting tough, I think of my marathon running. Well, if I can get to 26 miles, I'm sure I can get through this long meeting. You know what I mean? So uh, (laughs) I say that more jokingly, but in general, you know, anything that I've learned running, I've also been able to put it into my professional life or my personal life, right? Where when things get tough, just power through it. And like you said, put one foot in front of the other and just don't stop. So looking back, what advice would you give your 20 year old self? I would say, don't sweat the small stuff. I still struggle with this 100%, uh, this this aspect of time management, you know, and I think a lot of the times, you know, I, I still, again, suffer from serious FOMO at times. And a lot of the times it's the extrovertedness, extrovertedness <laughs> in me where I want to be ever there, everywhere. I want to do everything. And I think even young when I was uh, growing up and starting my career, I wanted to be everywhere and then I couldn't. And sometimes I made some decisions to be at places or to do things or commit to things that I you know, in retrospect, maybe shouldn't have just because I had other priorities, you know, and then that Mm -hmm. obviously also, you know, ran into issues in my career too. Whereas as I was growing, there was so many projects we wanted to do with a certain client because, you know, I do again, suffer from shiny object syndrome where, you know, something (laughs) comes on my desk and the agency is like, oh, we have to do this. And I'm like, well, I love it. Yes, we have to do this. But what about these other things? You know, so the reason I would have loved to have known that is that it it impacts everything in my life, you know, and and all aspects, like I said. So to 20 year old Jorge, I wish you would have been a little bit more precious with your time and some of the smaller stuff that happened, you know, just one of those where you just have to move on, you know, don't worry about it. All right. And then last question, we ask this to everyone on our show. If you had to sum up your career in three words, what would it be? Got it. I was prepared for this. Oh, I was like, is it got it? No, no, (laughs) because that's two. I would say always be extra. Tell me more. Yes. So the reason being, it actually started from a long time ago. There's this popular saying in the sales world of always be closing and, and, you know, closing deals, making yeah. commissions, all that coffees good stuff. Coffees for closers. Yeah. Coffees for closers. Yes. From there I was like, okay, well I like the always be piece. Right. But, but what's more me. And, and I don't know, you, you already know me. I'm very extroverted. I can talk yes. to anyone. So, so I'm very extra. I've always tried to do that with all my career jobs is just give a little extra, not only in terms of giving a little extra in terms of effort, but but just in my personality and my willing to help people um, that that's always what I've 
and sticking to always being extra. Yeah, I remember um, first meeting you in the office. Mm-hmm. You were like the first person to walk in and be like, hi, I'm Jorge. Um, <laughs> welcome to Avocados from Mexico. And you were just, you were really extra. I thought I was extroverted. And then I met you and I was like, I am calm. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? There's always going to be someone who's more extra. Yeah. And even now as, as moved on in other uh, worlds, I still find people that I'm like, okay, wow, I thought I was extra, but this person just takes it to another level. You yeah. Know? But Jorge, your extra has made us feel so welcome and everyone feels so special. So thank you for being extra. Well, I appreciate that a lot. And I think the last thing I'll say is, is where, where my life is now is, is my new job is a dad. So I'm a full-time dad and I have to plug in my, my beautiful daughter. She's six months and She's you know, beautiful. I know you're a parent as well. And, yeah. and parenthood is a you know challenge and a change in itself. But I will say that that's my most recent development and I'm loving it. And that's the next thing where everything changes every day, you know, and, and I'm just rolling with it. My wife and I thought we were prepared, but we, no. we yeah, yeah. No way. you're never going to be as prepared. And we're only dealing with one, but it's been, uh, you know, huge, huge, uh, you know, piece of my life that that just brings a lot of purpose. So, yeah, now now I like to say that's my my job. I'm a dad. Yeah. So we started with change at the beginning yes. of the conversation and then we ended with change. So thank you so much, Jorge, for sharing your story. I know that for a lot of people, change is a hard thing to accept, but you have brought a new light and joy and extra to change. So thanks. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed this. The Career Slay podcast is a co-production of Career Slay and Wild Reply, produced by Michael Burke. Stay tuned for some great conversations on slaying the fear in career. Oh,